Right, good afternoon everyone. I'm Ed Berger and I'd like to welcome you to the first of a series of half-hour webinars that the employment law team here at Hogan Levels will be running during 2013. Now, with these webinars, our aim is to keep you up to date with the most important legal developments that you need to be aware of and, as ever, have a focus on the practical implications. So what does it mean for you? Our topic today is an overview of the key changes we're expecting in 2013. We're also going to have a quick look back to last year and pick up on two themes that we think will remain relevant throughout this year. Now, I'm pleased to say that I'm joined by Chris Wellham and Joe Broadbend. And by way of reminder before we begin, a couple of housekeeping points. You can ask questions throughout the session using the Q&A widget on the dashboard. We'll try and answer all of these at the end of the session, and if we run out of time, we'll certainly get back to you in writing after the session is finished. You can also find a brief summary of the changes we're expecting this year and a copy of the slides that you're looking at now in the Resources tab. And for the lawyers amongst you, you can also claim half an hour of unaccredited CPD points by watching this session. So, what are we going to be looking at today? Well, in short, we're going to cover five themes. First, we're going to take a brief look at the changes that we know are coming into force between now and April. Then we're going to talk about the implications of some of the more significant reforms introduced by the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill. Now, we've got a bit more clarity in this area following various announcements made earlier in January. Next, we're going to move on to TUPI and have a look at the controversial suggestion that the service provision change be repealed. And then we're going to finish up by looking at two issues from last year that caused uh, a lot of heartache and pain. First, the interplay between sickness and holiday entitlement. And secondly, the risk for international employers of claims being brought in the UK, in the employment tribunals, from employees who are working globally around the world outside the UK. So to kick off, Joe, can you explain the changes that are coming into force in March 2013. Thanks, Ed. We're expecting some relatively minor changes to come into force in March. Uh, the first of these is the increase in the level of parental leave from 13 to 18 weeks per parent. However, as this is still going to be unpaid, and at least for the time being applies only to parents with children aged under five, we think we're unlikely to see a significant increase in uptake at this stage. There are then a couple of changes coming into force that are going to affect the Equality Act. The first is the repeal of the third-party harassment provisions, and these are the provisions that allow an employee to claim against their employer if they are harassed by a third party, such as a customer, for example. Uh, these are going to be repealed, but given that the, they've given rise to actually a relatively low number of cases so far, we don't really think of this as a particularly major reform. And we anticipate that if employees are subject to third-party harassment, they will in any event try and bring those as a freestanding discrimination or harassment claim in any event. The second Equality Act change, which is perhaps more significant, is the repeal of the discrimination questionnaire procedure. Now, most employers are going to welcome the fact that there isn't going to be a formal questionnaire procedure in the future, which, as we know, tends to be used as a way of trying to get some pre-action discovery and uh, improve the claimant's position or potential claimant's position with regard to settlement. One slight word of caution, uh, there was an ECJ case last year that found that a refusal to give information to a potential claimant could result in an inference of discrimination being drawn, and that was in the absence of a formal questionnaire process setting. So we're just going to have to wait to see, I think, whether claimants continue to seek information, even once the formal procedure for requesting information has been abolished. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, Chris, moving from March to April now, can you tell us what's happening the following month? Sure. In April, uh, we're going to see a few things change. Uh, so first off is the reduction in the consultation period 
uh, from 90 to 45 days, where you've got 100 or more um, employees um, proposed to be made redundant at one establishment. Now, this should help uh, in terms of uh, restructurings happening more quickly, but should still uh, assist in trying to maintain a high level of consultation, because if the employer doesn't do it right, then the protective award is still going to be uh, at 90 days' pay. Um, we should also get some clarification that the consultation rules won't apply, uh, won't apply to the expiry of fixed-term contracts, so they're gonna, going to be out of scope. At the same time, uh, the whistleblowing loophole that allows um, employees to claim protection as a whistleblower, where they make um, uh, allegations about breaches of their own employment contract, are going to be closed. Uh, and so to get um, protection, employees in the future are going to have to show that there's a public interest element um, to their disclosure. And this should make those tactical whistleblowing claims that, that we see that it's, are designed to either avoid the unfair dismissal of service provision or to try to take the cap off the compensatory award, hopefully a thing of the past. Um, in addition, the government has said that it's going to introduce some revised tribunal rules with effect from April. Uh, the main one here is going to be the introduction of a SIF um, that comes in after the ET1 and ET3 pleadings have been submitted. And this is going to be designed to try to weed out those claims that are slightly weaker at an earlier stage. Now, whether this is going to be a, a success is going to depend, of course, on how the uh, employment judges are going to uh, utilize their powers. Um, and in the past, we've found that there's been little, little appetite, to be honest, um, for the judges to, to remove claims when they've got similar powers, so there could be little change. Um, finally, there's the much publicised um, George Osborne's employee shareholder uh, status will be introduced. Uh, and as you probably know, this is going to allow employers to give employee uh, shares um, with favourable CGT tax treatment, um, basically in return for giving up certain employment rights such as um, the ability to make an unfair dismissal claim or a claim uh, in relation to a statutory redundancy payment. Now, our understanding from the consultation process was that there was um, sort of little enthusiasm for these changes, and so it, it may be that there's very little uptake in practice. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. So that covers nicely the, the changes we can expect in early 2013. Uh, Joe, looking forward a few months to the summer, what are the key changes we're expecting from the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Bill when it comes into force? One of the first changes we're expecting in the summer, although we don't have a precise date for that as yet, is the introduction of pre-termination offers to settle, which were initially proposed in the Ending the Employment Relationship consultation exercise last year. And what those are designed to do is allow employers to raise the possibility of an agreed termination of employment with an employee while knowing that the employee won't be able to uh, give evidence about that offer in support of a later unfair dismissal claim. And at the moment, offers of this type are sometimes relied upon in support of a constructive dismissal claim or as evidence that an employer had already made up its mind to dismiss the employee before they'd gone through a fair procedure, which then would render that subsequent dismissal unfair. That sounds very interesting, Joe. So, so basically, are we saying that employers are allowed to make without prejudice offers even if there isn't a formal dispute? That's absolutely right. What, what this proposal is seeking to do is close off that debate about whether there's a dispute in existence between the parties. There's also going to be a statutory code which will contain a template documentation and that's going to un underpin the process. And what the government has said is that as long as an employer follows the code, they can be as confident as possible that the employee won't be able to refer to that offer in subsequent proceedings. But really that, that phrase, as confident as possible, is really the rub. We know that the offer is only going to be inadmissible in uh, ordinary unfair dismissal proceedings. So it is going to be possible to refer to a pre-termination offer in discrimination or automatic unfair dismissal proceedings. And it's also going to be possible to refer to an offer if the employer has engaged in what's been termed improper conduct. What that amounts to will be set out in the code, but we think it's going to cover things like uh, some sort of discriminatory motive behind the proceedings. Okay, thanks, Joe. I'm just picking up on one point there. You mentioned template documentation. Now, will employers be obliged to use these templates to get the protection of this scheme? 
No. It is reasonably clear from the government's response to consultation that the templates are primarily aimed at small employers who do not have access to <coughs> HR or legal advice, um, employers who already have their own documentation and settlement agreements can continue to use those as long as they comply with the basic principles that are going to be set out in the code. Okay, moving on. Chris, another issue raised in the ending the employment relationship consultation was whether unfair dismissal compensation should be reduced. What are we expecting to happen on that front? Yeah, well, the consultation um, raised two key questions. The first one was whether the overall cap on compensatory awards should be reduced. Uh, and the second one was whether an individual cap, um, basically per employee, uh, of 12 months pay should be introduced. And in a fairly significant move, the government has confirmed that it's not going to reduce um, the overall uh, a compensatory um, award cap, which, by the way, increases to £74,200 this Friday. Um, but it is going to impose the, the one year's cap um, for particular employees uh, under unfair dismissal compensation. Okay, so this concept of one year's pay is, is clearly going to be very important. Can you tell us how that is going to be calculated? Yeah, we think it's going to be done um, by reference to the concept of a week's pay. So that's going to include things like salary and contractual bonuses, but it's going to exclude um, pension contributions, expenses or discretionary bonuses. Well, that certainly sounds helpful for the employer. Is there anything else that employers need to be aware of here? Yeah, there's going to be some fines that are going to be introduced for employers who lose tribunal claims uh, and where their, their conduct in breaching the employment laws has aggravating features. Now, the explanatory notes to the bill suggest that these aggravating features are going to include uh, a number of factors such as um, how long the breach has continued, whether there was any malice involved, uh, and also the size of the employer. Um, and we think this means that the larger the employers, um, the greater they're going to be under obligation to avoid a breach of employment law. Now, these fines are going to be set at between £100 and £5,000, uh, and they're going to be linked to the compensation that was actually awarded to the employee. Although, interestingly, it's not going to be paid to the employee, it's going to be paid to the government, um, which I expect is a nice little learner for them. Um, and presumably, it's designed to try to encourage employers to settle at an earlier stage. Um, and we can certainly see employees using it as some, some form of leverage within any settlement discussions. Okay. Whilst we're still on the question of money, everyone's favourite topic, Chris, c can you just explain where we got to on the introduction of fees in the employment tribunal? Yeah, we're expecting that um, claimants are going to have to pay a fee to lodge a claim in the employment tribunals from this summer, um, and we think that's probably going to be sometime in July or August, uh, and this could prompt um, a glut of claims just before that. Um, where employees are seeking to submit their claim forms before these fines come into play. Um, and the level of the fees is going to be um, determined by the perceived complexity of the claims. So um, the more complex claims are meant to be those such as unfair dismissal and discrimination, um, and they're going to attract higher fees. And then you've got the simplistic style of claims, which are going to be unauthorized deductions or breach of contract claims. Now, actually, for, for lodging um, the claim, there's going to be a fee of £160 for the more simple claims and £230 for the more complex claims. Then, if the claim goes the full way to hearing, there's going to be a second fee that's payable, and that's going to be 250 for the simple claims and £950 for the more complex claims. Now, the tribunals can order a losing respondent to reimburse the claimant their, their fees um, at the end of the hearing, but reimbursement isn't an obligation. Right. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Joe, over to you again. Alongside this concept of pre-termination offers, the government is also pursuing the idea of pre-claim conciliation. Can you tell us how that's going to work? This is really the government's big idea for promoting settlement of claims before they enter the tribunal system. And what's intended is that for most claims, employees will have to refer a dispute to ACAS before they are then able to go on and lodge a claim with the employment tribunal. And we've just had quite a lot more detail about how this is going to work in practice 
although it's not clear at this stage exactly when it's going to come into force, and, and hence you'll see the square brackets around summer 2013 on the slide. What's going to happen is that employees are going to get in touch with ACAS by completing normally an online form, and that will contain very brief details, which really will only extend to things like the employee's name, their address, and their contact details. They're not going to have to provide any information about the nature of the dispute with the employer at that early stage. That online form is going to be referred to an administrative officer who will get in contact with the employee. The claim will then be referred to a conciliator who will get in touch with the employer. Following contacting both parties, there's then going to be a month-long period for the parties to enter into conciliation if they wish to do so. There isn't going to be any compunction on either party to enter into conciliation if they don't choose to do so. If after a month or, or a shorter period, if possible, the claim hasn't uh, been successfully conciliated or at any stage either party has said they don't want to participate further, a certificate of completion is going to be issued by ACAP, and at that point, the employee is going to be free to lodge their claim with the tribunal. Okay, thanks, Chair. That's a, that's a very helpful summary, but it does sound a bit messy to me. How do you think this is going to work in practice? I think it's really difficult at this stage to say how successful this is going to be in achieving the government's objective of reducing the number of uh, tribunal claims. I think there are two uh, key concerns. The first is whether or not ACAS is actually going to have sufficient resources to be able to conciliate claims within what is actually a pretty short window of time. Um, and we can also see quite a few disputes arising about whether or not claims have been lodged in time once the conciliation uh, window <coughs> ends. Uh, although the conciliation window stops the clock on time running for presenting a claim, Obviously, then there's a question of whether or not the claim has been presented in time following the end of the period. And certainly, there was a trend in disputes of that nature under the uh, previous statutory dispute resolution procedures. Okay, thanks, Joe. Now, Joe and Chris have outlined the main changes that we know we're expecting to employment law in 2013. However, as you may know, within the last couple of weeks, the government has published its long-awaited consultation paper on the reform to the CHUPI regulations. Chris, turning to you, are there any big changes being suggested here? Yeah, there's, there's certainly a big one, and, and that's the um, proposal to basically remove the service provision change rules that were introduced in 2006 on the basis that they're unnecessary gold plating. Uh, and the suggestion is, is that they should be repealed after a suitable transitional period. Now, this means that we're going to revert back to the, the complicated and confused pre-2006 case law, uh, which centred on whether an outsourcing would, in actual fact, amount to uh, a cheapy transfer. Now, while the current regime has uh, admittedly become a bit confused in recent years because of um, the case law that we've seen, uh, removing the service provision change provisions is likely to lead to yet more confusion. Um, it's also been suggested that the GP employee liability information um, rules should be removed. Um, and this was where uh, due diligence um, information of a fairly simplistic nature had to be provided 14 days before the transfer. Um, and because of that proximity to the transfer date, they were an actual fact of limited use. And so it's questionable as to you know, whether or not it's going to make a great deal of difference. Okay, thanks, Chris. And are there any other positive changes that we should know about acting for employers? Yeah, I think the government understands the, the problems that business has faced around affecting dismissals or changes to terms and conditions of employment where there's a GP transfer and wants to try to make it easier for businesses as far as possible given um, the, the restraints that there are in, in the underlying directive. Uh, and one particularly welcome change is around what happens where there's a change of location on a, a cheapy transfer. Because at the moment, a switching location um, can lead to uh, dismissals being automatically unfair. And this is a problem because in many outsourcings in particular, a change of location is a given. It's, it's, it's always going to happen and it's difficult to avoid. 
So the government is proposing to make it clear that a change in location will amount to uh, an ETO reason or an economic, technical or organisational reason entailing changes in the workforce, as we all know. Um, and this should mean that a change in location is therefore an ETO. It won't be an automatically unfair dismissal, and provided that there's a fair process that's followed in relation to any resulting redundancy, um, that dismissal should be fair. Um, the government is also, lastly, um, consulting on whether they can make it easier for dismissals to take place um, before uh, the transfer uh, and for collective redundancy consultation also to play, take place before a transfer, where it's the transferee that's actually proposing uh, those collective redundancies. I mean, that's something that's troubled um, people for a, a long time and hopefully these, the, any new rules will make it much easier. Okay, thanks Chris. Now, a as ever, this consultation process with the government is likely to take some time. And with that in mind, is there anything that clients should be looking to do in the meantime? Yeah, I mean, you're right there. The service provision change rules are likely to continue in their current form um, for at least some time. Uh, and if clients are dealing with outsourcing, then I think they, should, you know, they need to be aware that the law has got very complicated um, in, in recent years and that they, it, it's not an automatic given that GP is going to apply um, where there's an outsourcing or, or an insourcing. And I think there's probably four key points that clients should think about if they do have um, an outsourcing situation. Um, but the first one is, do the activities remain the same before and after the transfer? Because um, in one case, there was just a 15% uh, decrease in, in the services that were being provided, and that was enough to mean that there wasn't a service provision change and GP didn't apply. Similarly, is the actual way in which those services are being provided, is that going to change before and after um, the transfer date? Because in, in another case, the services were provided by one person. After the transfer, they were provided by a number of different people. And it, it was held that that of itself um, created a, a change such that the service provision changes didn't apply. Um, lastly, is there an organized grouping of employees providing the services for the client? If not, it's possible there won't be a transfer. Um, and this is even if, in practice, um, the employees do um, end up working for a, a particular client. So if the parties want to be to apply, then it's very sensible, for example, to have a team of employees who are you know, named and definitely assigned to one particular client to ensure that Chief is going to apply. And finally, we've got this issue of is is the client the same before and after the transfer? And this is particularly relevant in the context of um, also uh, business transfers. So if you've got a business transfer where the client changes and at the same time um, the client's going to change the service uh, provider, then the current case law says cheap is not going to apply there. It's really something to be careful of. Um, one, one last point on service provision changes is that Obviously, they're going to change, it seems, in, in the near future, and so uh, clients need to be aware when they're negotiating um, new outsourcing arrangements that there's a possibility that within however long it's going to be, um, GP may not apply at the end of an outsourcing. And so they need to be careful in their exit provisions to cater for that, because after uh, these changes have been made, um, the, the, the parties may want to arrange something different. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, <clears throat> plenty to get to grips with there on, on, the, on the complicated issue of Tupi. Now, uh, to finish off, what I'd like to do is turn to a couple of issues that caused difficulties for employers last year, and we think will continue to cause difficulties this year and indeed perhaps in the years to come. The first issue is the interaction between sickness and holiday pay, and this continues to be a difficult, vexed question. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few scenarios. Joe, can you explain the position of someone on long-term sick leave asked to take holiday? Um, it's quite clear, as a matter of European law, a worker on long-term sick leave both accrues holiday and can take it during a period of sick leave as long as there's nothing in national law to prevent that. So a worker on sick leave can take holiday and should be paid for it in the normal way as there's nothing in a domestic UK law that would stop that from happening. Okay, great. Chris, moving to our second scenario. What's the position if a worker who is on holiday or due to take holiday then becomes ill? 
Can that worker then reschedule his or her holiday to a later date? Uh, yes, he can. Um, the EU case law says that holiday and, and sick leave are essentially for different purposes, and therefore a worker can't be forced to take holiday during a period of sick leave. So in those circumstances, a worker must be, able to, uh, must be allowed to take their holiday at a later date if they've been ill. Okay, now feedback from many employers is that they have concerns that this allows the unscrupulous employee perhaps to take more holiday than they're entitled to. By effectively converting holiday into a period of paid sick leave and then taking holiday again at a later date. What are your views on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's possibly open to abuse and to protect themselves, employers m should, should make the employees aware that normal sickness absence reporting procedures should apply uh, as much during holiday as during the working week. So if an employee fails to report sickness while they're on holiday, um, if, in accordance with the policy, then they wouldn't be entitled to contractual sick pay. Now, this may act as a disincentive um, to those who are seeking to take advantage of the system. Okay, now turning to our third scenario. What happens if an employee on long-term sick leave comes back to work? Joe, can that employee take the holiday he or she has accrued during the entire absence? Well, as we've discussed, an employee can accrue leave during sickness absence and can't then be forced to take it. However, depending on the length of the absence, that may conflict with the normal use it or lose it provision under the working time regulations, under which obviously normally an employee is not entitled to carry unused holiday forward from one year to the next. Having said that, after a Court of Appeal decision last year, it's now clear that tribunals have to ignore the use it or lose it principle and allow employees to carry holiday forward where they've been unable to take that holiday because of sickness absence. Um, it's also clear that the employee doesn't have to make a specific request to carry leave forward. Normally that carry forward would happen automatically. So in the scenario we're talking about here, uh, the employee will almost certainly be able to carry some of his accrued holiday entitlement forward to a new leave year and then take it following his return to work. However, as Chris is going to explain, the exact amount he can carry forward may still be subject to some uh, dispute or debate. Okay, thanks. So Chris, can you explain in a bit more detail in the context of, say, a capability dismissal following an extended sickness period of absence? How much pay in lieu would be due in this situation? Yeah, well, we know that employees can carry holiday forward without needing to, to ask for it to be carried forward. The question is how much holiday can be carried forward and for how long. And there have been some EU cases here um, that make it clear that carry forward doesn't have to, have to be allowed forever. Um, and there have been cases that have said that a carry forward period of 15 months was, was okay, um, whereas uh, a carry forward period of nine months was too short. Um, and there have been other cases that say that um, the carry forward only applies to um, the four weeks basic entitlement given under the directive and any additional holiday granted by national law isn't covered by that. I think the problem at the moment is we just don't know whether tribunals are going to be um, prepared to imply these limitations into the way that they interpret the working time regs um, in the cases they determine. So at the moment, most employers seem to be basically assuming in these situations that as long as they pay out for holiday that's accrued in the year of termination and for the year preceding that, then they should be okay. Um, but we are hopeful that we're going to get a bit more clarity when the government uh, eventually publishes its response to the annual leave elements of the, work, of the modern workplaces consultation, because that indicated that the government was going to clear this position up. Okay, many thanks, Chris. Finally, we're going to have a look at one issue which has caused a lot of case law in the last few years. Joe, can you tell us about when an employee who works mainly outside Great Britain can bring an unfair dismissal or indeed a discrimination claim in the employment tribunals against a British employer? Thanks, Ed. The, the law in this area changed in quite an important way last year. Uh, and until last year, we thought that in order to bring a claim uh, in Great Britain, an employer would have to sort of shoehorn themselves into a particular category, such as an expat employer or a peripatetic employee. Um, alternatively, they could show equally strong connections with Great Britain, uh, but this was relatively difficult. Then last year, the Supreme Court clarified that the correct test, where an employee worked wholly outside uh, Great Britain, 
is whether they have a stronger connection with Great Britain than the place in which the work is carried out. And the test is looser where some, some work has been carried out in Great Britain. Then there just needs to be a sufficiently strong connection with Great Britain for Parliament to have intended that that individual in that position should be able to uh, pursue an employer in the UK Employment Tribunal. Okay, so what, what does this mean in practice? Well, that issue is still being worked out, but we think it means that in future it will be a bit easier for employees who are not based in Great Britain to bring tribunal proceedings here, and that will particularly be the case where some work has been carried out in Great Britain. Okay, so w with that in mind, is there anything that employers can or indeed should do to protect themselves against these types of claims? Well, the sorts of factors that courts have taken into account in deciding whether an individual has a sufficiently strong connection with Great Britain include matters such as whether the employee is entitled to benefits under the benefit structure that would apply to um, employees based here, whether or not English law governs the contractual arrangement. It may be relevant whether the employee has specifically asked whether he retains his statutory rights in, in Great Britain, particularly if he or she has been told that they do. Um, if HR issues are being handled from a UK base, for example, arrangements relating to the termination of employment, that might be key. Uh, the fact that the employee regards Great Britain as his home base, so he might live here and then travel to do his work um, overseas. And where the employee is paid and where he pays his tax and social security contributions. And bearing those sorts of factors in mind when shaping the arrangements of employees who are being posted to work abroad may help employers reduce the risk of claims from employees who are based outside Great Britain. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Now, that almost wraps up the session for today. But before we get on to the final bit of housekeeping, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, the first question that comes in relates, I think, to the ACAS conciliation process. And the question is this, as I understand it, is that if both parties go through the ACAS conciliation process and, and do everything that they need to do under that process, if it's unsuccessful, is there still a tribunal fee for the employee to pay if they want to go ahead and bring a claim, or does the fact that they've taken the time to try and conciliate get them out of having to pay the fee? No, I think these are intended to be two entirely separate processes. The first issue around pre-claim conciliation is if you do not go through that process for the majority of claims, you will not then be able to lodge an employment tribunal claim, so you need to go through the pre-claim conciliation first. You've gone through that, you've got your certificate of completion, you then lodge your claim in the tribunal and the fees will apply to you in the normal way. So I think the two things are quite distinct. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Joe. Uh, looking at the second question now, which I will give to Chris so he doesn't feel left out, this relates to the holiday pay and the sickness issue. And the scenario that we've been asked about is where an employee is off sick and they then went, want to go on and take holiday. And the question, quite rightly, is presumably they should not claim both sick pay and holiday pay at the same time. Chris, what are your views on that one? Yeah, that's right. You, you won't get double recovery if, if an individual has requested to take um, holiday during a period of sick leave, then you know, they're not going to be paid twice. But say, for example, that the individual has exhausted their company's sick pay or, or even that company sick pay is a reduced percentage of normal pay, um, the individual would, during a period of holiday that they elected to take during their sick um, leave, be in, entitled to be paid um, full pay during that period. So if sick pay has been exhausted, they get full pay during that time, um, and if they're being paid a reduced rate whilst on sick pay, um, the, the employer would be required to make a top-up to make it full pay during that period. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, that does, unfortunately, bring us to the end of our allotted time slot, so it's time to close today's webinar. Thank you very much for joining us, and we do hope you found it useful. Now, a favor from you, as this is the first webinar we've run, we would be particularly interested if you could respond to the questionnaire, questionnaire that we'll be sending to you shortly by email. And we're particularly interested to know the topics you'd like to cover in the future, um, and the level of detail that you think we've gone into and what would be useful. 
So thanks very much once again for joining us. There have been a couple of questions that we were asked that we don't have time to answer now, but we will be getting back to you in writing on those this afternoon. So thank you very much and have a good afternoon.